spirit of prophecy, three main sections. The first section was um, related with the definition and also the biblical background for the spirit of prophecy. The second section um, presented uh, Sister White and also the different publications, but especially emphasized was given to the series of the great controversy. The third and last section of these presentations um, considered all the criticism and the different accusations against the publications and in, in, general, in general about the spirit of prophecy. During the time of Sister White and also after her death. Now, this um, presentation that we will consider now analyzes um, official um, accusation because all the other ones were rumors and general criticism. But now we are speaking about the accusation of plagiarism. Plagiarism, in other words, is a synonym of copying. So you use what somebody else has done, you somehow uh, manipulate this information, and then you put your name. This is plagiarism. So Sister White received the official accusation that she was a plagiarist. And that was going through different uh, periods of time, but we will consider specifically and particularly the case when uh, one group of Protestant churches sued the Seventh-day Adventist Church for using the books of Sister White. And this is important that you know um, in order to have a clear picture about the situation and also the result of this investigation and this suit. And this is what we are going to do today. Okay, <clears throat> let us um, review a little bit what we have considered until now. The origin of the accusation. Can please somebody read for me um, the first chapter, uh, the first paragraph, please. In 1889, D.M. Canwright started it with a book and a public debate. When he was living in Otsego, Ots Michigan, he was invited by a Protestant minister from California to speak to the community of the, of the background of the Adventist heresy. Canwright had just published Seventh-day Adventism renounced. A public debate was organized for eight evenings in a theater in Heldsburg. Pastor William Haley confronted him with the help of J.N. Lowborough. Lowborough. Yeah. So let us see who was this D. M. Canwright. Canwright was a Seventh-day Adventist minister during the time of Sister White. And she, uh, he held different positions in the church, but um, um, finally he rejected the Adventist doctrine and he focused himself in the direct work against the books of the Spirit of Prophecy. So the higher point came in 1889 when he, uh, in a series of lectures, together with Protestant ministers in California, um, presented a long list of accusations to confirm the plagiarism <coughs> of the books of Sister White. And uh, <coughs> because that was a public debate, also um, two pastors of the Seventh-day Adventists came there to confront him and also to answer and to give an explanation to these uh, accusations. And especially William Haley and G. N. Lowborough was, um, Lowborough especially, 
the one that confronted and give answer to the majority of the accusations. Um, so since 1887, Kanwright had totally renounced the doctrines of the Sabbath, the sanctuary, conditional immortality, Christ's second coming, and Ellen G. White's prophetic gift. On February 1st and 12th, he threw a torrent of accusations against Ellen G. White. She was a false prophet, she was not inspired, half of the great controversy had been copied from other authors, and the church had eliminated or modified her first writings. Authors like Willie, the OBGN, Urias Smith, James White, G. N. Andrews were mentioned without any credit. So these were only some of the accusations. So, but in 1889 came to this public debate and become a public debate for three main reasons. One, because the books of Sister White were famous in this country. They were uh, published repeatedly in different editions, were um, almost bestsellers at her time. So that was not accusation that was not known for nobody. And uh, the public didn't uh, knew about this. So this was a famous, author, Sister White, and also her books. So this is one of the reasons why it became a public debate. The second main reason was because the Seventh-day Adventist at this time was a well-known, uh, organized, and recognized church in the United States. So it was not like considered like an isolated, or without importance, um, religious group was an influential and very good organized with a lot of institutions already at this time. So SDA Church was well known for the general public also in the United States. And the third main reason was the rapidly increase of membership of the Seventh-day Adventists at this time in the United States. And this also raised the opposition from the Protestant churches. So these accusations from Kanwright, his rejection for the Sabbath, his rejection for the sanctuary, the main Seventh-day Adventist doctrines was um, an important point for them to use it strategically to um, destroy, according to their uh, plan, the influence and also the, uh, the importance of the Seventh-day Adventist Church during this period of time in the United States. So let us see how the things uh, develop. <coughs> Pastor G. N. Loboro was the first to publish uh, articles um, giving explanation. Because if you can imagine, it was very difficult for Sister White to defend herself. Uh, especially if she needed to say, okay, this is not true because that was so and so. And this is also false because this and this. So it was decided that it was much better that somebody neutral that was not any relative of Sister White, and also not Sister White herself, to defend and to represent uh, the publications because the publications were not considered as her private property. Because also these publications represent the church and were printed in the publishing houses of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So in this case was decided that official representation of the General Conference defended the origin of these books and especially the spirit of prophecy as such. So he was the first of all that took official position toward the defense of the spirit of prophecy and we, he even wrote a book and is the spirit of prophecy. And I recommended you 
to read it carefully because the first section has to do with the general um, guidelines through the Old and the New Testament and the last section has to do specifically with the time of Sister White and some of the books published at this time. So um, let us consider now the nature and extent of use of other authors. Uh, we have mentioned some of them during our last presentations. Uh, we have explained also the parallelism and also the differences. But now uh, we wish to mention the majority of them and in um, how far any influence was um, uh, present there. So all this presentation is based on, let me see one second. LNG White Integrity by L.B. Pereira. Um, this um, person wrote a um, doctor work about this specific um, a case of Sister White and all the problematic of the accusation of plagiarism. So um, I recommended you to read it. But uh, what I will present to you is like a summary of the main points in this um, doctor work. So at her death, Sister White left a library with as many as 1,000 books. Sister White did not only read books, but also articles from conservative Protestant writers. So what this mean? Uh, you have here mentioned some of the authors that were well known at the time of Sister White that were considered um, a very serious and um, respected writers related with the history of Christianity and specifically about the Protestant reform. And she wrote this and she mentioned in several occasions these publications um, she never hid the existence of these books in her own library and even recommended through different persons to read it and to consider carefully. So this is a fact and nobody tried to hide this, that these books were in the library of Sister White. Okay, now Related with the use of the material for references, for consultation or for assistance that she used um, included historical, geographical, chronological, doctrinal material and information about prophetic interpretations. For example, all the explanation from the 2,300 evenings and mornings, if you read from Blist, the biography of William Miller and his memories, then you will find the complete explanation, even the complete diagram of it. So when we find the explanation in the great controversy, it's inspired in this biography of Bliss that was a personal friend of uh, William Miller that worked with him, was also a minister, and um, synthesized or put together more than 120 sermons of William Miller in the form of articles and after become a completely book. So it's clear and everybody knew at the time of Sister White because the majority of the Seventh-day Adventists have this book about the explanation of the 2300 evening and mornings, the connection with the book of James White about the trumpets, about Matthew 25, that is the correlation with the middle night cry that also introduce the first angel message. So 
all these publications, also from Croissier and Iron Edson about the sanctuary, these were articles and publications well known for all the Seventh-day Adventists and even for the general Protestant uh, believers, even um, especially, sorry, because appear in um, Protestant um, magazines. So that was not something new or any surprise that Sister Y, as a member of the Seventh-day Adventist, and, and she explained first, second, and third angel message together with the Middle Night Cry and uh, Matthew 25 and Matthew 24, that uh, all these truths were included in these books. And you find in Great Controversy sections very similar to the explanation of um, Andrews about the history of the Sabbath, because Andrews wrote a very, uh, very, very important volume about the history of the Sabbath. To him was giving the um, responsibility to search about when and when to begin and when to close the Sabbath. And we know that his research was extremely important that the General Conference took the decision that Sabbath need to be kept from sunset to sunset because at the beginning they keep it from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, this is what Joseph Bates brought from Rachel Oaks. Okay, so uh, all this section of the great controversy that deal with the development of the Sabbath and keeping of the Sabbath during all the dark ages of the Middle Age uh, was mentioned all this information before through um, Andrews. And um, all these authors still alive during this time of accusation explain that not plagiarism from the site of Sister White was mentioned, especially because this um, heritage of these uh, basic doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventists were the uh, support columns of the truth and the fundamentation of the church hims uh, himself. So that she mentioned all these truths that were mentioned in the other books from Seventh-day Adventist authors was never, ever considered a plagiarism from the authors that were brothers and sisters in the church from Sister White. So that was the first section of the accusations that were put aside because of these main um, elements. <clears throat> Now, um, Loguro explained in a very um, fascinated way the spirit of prophecy, so I emphasize that please read this book. And he already mentioned in this uh, public debate that why we concentrate only in the things that are common with other books, why we don't focus in the things that are different, that are not in other books. And then only through the comparison of the proportion of differences that you find between the other books and this of Sister White, you will come to the conclusion that are original publications. Because never Sister White denied what kind of book she had in her library and that she have read these books, have consulted the books, and even recommended other people to read these books. So any kind of um, hiding process or trying to, to diminish the importance of the consultation of these books were done. So that is, again, a third confirmation of the honesty and the open way how these publications were prepared. 
Even uh, James White wrote in 1880, in her published works, there is much material not found in other books. Um, Sister White also wrote to Rias Smith, that pub was the publisher and was published sorry, in the Review and Herald, in which she declares, and after I had written my six articles for how to live, I then searched the various works on hygiene and was surprised to find them so nearly in harmony with what the Lord had revealed to me. And to show this harmony and to set before my brethren and sisters the subject as brought out by evil writers, able writers, I determined to publish How to Live, in which I largely extracted from the works referred to. So that was published in 1867. We know that even Sister White visited um, a health institute that was not from the Seventh-day Adventist church even before the sanatorium was built because uh, she received instructions from the Lord that we need to do everything that is possible to use natural healing um, methods in order to uh, recover the health and even to prevent diseases. Now, she received during a long period of time information, visions, uh, references about all this subject. And that was right down in different art articles, manuscripts, also personal letters um, giving counsel to a specific uh, problems with diet or health. And she never say or uh, try to give the impression that she was a medical doctor or a therapist or, or in any uh, way try to give the impression that she have or knowledge that don't um, um, have acquired by herself. But through these visions and information that the Lord inspired was a great help for many people. And through this writing in different articles also came the idea to put this together and then uh, publish the book, How I Live. The problem that she had at the beginning to give the authorization for the publishing, first preparing and after publishing this book, was she feel very insecure because um, she realized that she don't have any medical um, education background and she was very afraid that people will say, what is this for a thing that is here if she don't have any uh, special education, how we are going to, to accept or even believe what is there? And this was one of the motivations why she began to search and to find out if somebody else had write about this, natural healing, natural therapies. And she was very uh, positive surprised when she realized that she that she that what she received from the Lord and need to be shared with the people of God and with all the world was not something that was completely new, that nobody can confirm that this is real in this, this work. And she, in this article, says, I have um, search in different works in order to have the internal confirmation that this what um, uh, I am um, writing is not something completely uh, new that is not references, not uh, any explanation before. So that was the reason of it. <clears throat> this is related with the health books. Now, related with the great controversy, we have considered, if you remember some days ago, also the introduction or the fourth word of the great controversy that she wrote personally, because some of the four words of the publication of Sister White's are not right by herself, but for the 
trustees of the General Conference, um, LNG White uh, states, but in this case, completely forward of the great controversy from May 1888 was um, right down for her, from her, and as we have considered, she explained that different publications and different historical references and geographical backgrounds were considered in order to put in the correct chronological order and the, in the right historical setting all the information that was related with past historical facts, especially the um, Protestant reform in Europe. And um, this book appeared also with this introduction even before the debate from Can Wright's book came to existence in February 1889. So this all these elements were very, very important to uh, consider in the explanation of the accusations going on at this time. <clears throat> okay, that was the higher level in this uh, public debate led by Kandright related with this accusation of plagiarism. Now, um, in um, approximately in the 50s, again, we have a higher point of level of accusation against. So everything that was in the past gathered with all the other compiled publications after her death in 1915 uh, present the uh, criticism and the accusation of plagiarism to the Seventh-day Church, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, and now the General Conference decided that this point need to be clarified at once and need to be final. So the accusation was not only for plagiarism but was also for uh, copyrights, a violation, um, infractions of the copyrights, and because of this needed to be sued, the publishing house of the General Conference for publishing repeatedly books from the past and also new compilations. So because of this um, situation, um, let me see, the General Conference asked for legal assistance. The situation was so difficult that was needed, so they, the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, hired um, the Ramick Wright firm, firm of lawyers to investigate all the situation. If really, according to the legal regulations of the time of Sister White, and even after her death, was a violation of the copyrights. If any plagiarism of accusation can be confirmed and proved the Seventh-day Adventist Church General Conference, LNG White Trustees, says that they will bring back all the books and not reprint it again if, according to the legal matters, is a copyright violation. And the confirmation of plagiarism is confirmed. Okay? So they hired this completely... Uh, group of lawyers, but especially Vincent L. Point Ramick uh, prepared a completely memorandum of law literary property rights from 1790 to 1915. And um, according to his research about all the copyright laws from this year 
1790 to 1915 um, was investigated and compared with the writings, the content, and the way of presentation of the book of, of Sister White until 1950. This work was done and according to the revision of all the facts and the legal report, the official conclusion was that not plagiarism was in her works and don't constitute any infraction or piracy of copyright. And that is a legal resolution. And for this reason, nobody else until now um, has raised this question because legally was proof that not copyright violation was or can be applied to the writings of Sister White. That was um, a period of long time even people say, yeah, but this um, group of lawyers that the General Conference hired were Adventists is not true. These were Catholics, uh, and they choose them with purpose. So no Protestants, because the majority of the accusations came from the Protestant churches, but not Seventh-day Adventists, because this will be not ethical. So they choose a Catholic group of lawyers completely neutral about this internal doctrinal um, issue between the Protestant churches and the Seventh-day Adventist church. And they offer to them all the publications, free uh, research possibility in the Ellen G. White trustees, uh, manuscripts, letters, and articles. And... Um, that was the conclusion, especially this Vincent, Vincent L. Ramick. Um, he said, unfortunately, I was not able to go through all the books, but one especially impressed me. And he said that was the desire of ages. He remained Catholic, okay? So he was not converted to Seventh-day Adventist. But he wrote a personal testimony and said, uh, I knew... Uh, God, Jesus, since I was born. But when I read the Sire of Ages and even the other books that the accusation was that Sister White take, like Hannah's book, do you remember? We have made this parallel with the desire, also with the life of Christ that after became the Sire of Ages. And he say, as a Catholic, when I read the book of Hannah's, this don't impress me at all. But when I took the book of the Sire of Ages, I was not able to stop to read. And I realized that another spirit in a completely different way of the presentation of Jesus was available. And I was very, very much impressed. And I become an even greater lover, lover of Jesus after reading this book. And I have my book, this book, in my library and I will read it again and again. So he even recognized the um, spiritual content of the different books uh, as a proof of the um, spirit of prophecy. So this was a very, very important point. So if somebody mentioned to you the books of Canwright, that Ellen, um, the um, white lie is a more recent book related with this and based in the accusations of Can Rights and his book, you can with all certainty present the fact that that was investigated, all the possible accusations for violation of copyrights and plagiarism, and officially all the suit was drawn back because of lack of evidences. And since this time, no other accusations officially in the level of legal matters were erased because of the completely answer was given. Now, this group of lawyers also um, presented different aspects and we wish to present it to you also. One is the ethical aspect 
of the content. And the grandson, no, excuse me, the, the son of a Sister White, William White, presented different um, cases about this uh, ethical aspect. In 1904, we find at times she found it difficult to express in words the sins presented to her, and when she will find a correct representation in some other book, she sometimes copies sentences and paragraphs, okay? So that was never denied. 1911, again, her son uh, confirmed that um, he remembered that his parents read the works of the historian, the OBGN. And that was nothing to be hide. In 1912, in Select Messages, book three, page 447, says, Mother found such perfect description of events and presentation of event and pres okay, let me see. And presentation of facts and of doctrines written out in our denominational books that she copied the words of these authorities. That was the internal denominational books I, I have mentioned to you from Lowborough, from Crozier, after was also no more a member of the church, uh, Andrews and her own husband, okay? If you read the story of the Sabbath of Andrews that I will recommend that you to, to read it, um, you will find many parallelisms from the first section of the great controversy, especially related with the uh, keeping of the Sabbath during the Middle Age. In 1928, in Select Messages Book 3, pages 459 to 465, we find some of the information that we already mentioned. Can please somebody read it for us? In 1928, previous to her work of writing on the life of Christ and during the time of her writing, she read, the, she read from the work of Hannah, Fleetwood Farrar, and Dickey. I never knew of her reading Edersham. Ed she occasionally referred to Andrews, particularly with a reference to chronology. The reason given by W.C. White are the following. She saw panoramic scenes and flashlight scenes of the great controversy. She studied the Bible and the history and the writing of men who had presented the life of our Lord to get the chronological and geographical connection. She admired the language in which other writers had presented to their readers the scene which God had presented to her in vision. And she found it both a pleasure and a convenience and an economy of time to use their language fully or in part. The habit of using part of sentence, sentences found in the writing other, writings of other and filling in a part of her own composition. So that was always recognized, as I have mentioned to you, for example, the speech of Luther or the speech of Hus, or the speech of Wesley and Wycliffe, yeah? Then it's this kind of um, insertions that we find in the Great Controversy. In 1938, also her son uh, write a brief statement and say, she looked at religious books and periodicals. She read the Bible and the ecclesiastic history and paraphrased some declarations. Okay, 1934, also Selig Messages, book three, page 462. Can please somebody read it for us? 1934? Yes, please. She read diligently the history of the Reformation. Much of the Obene history she read aloud to my father. He mentions also the material she read while Uriah Smith was editor of the review. He passed on to her religious periodicals and she would spend a portion of her time in scanning them and selecting material which sometimes appeared in the review. According to her brief statements, her mind had been directed to select such material. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so 
In 1935, we find also um, different statements that confirm what we have um, mentioned until now. Um, and um, um, as we have done at the beginning of these uh, presentations, the reference of the Bible, how we find also there paraphrase and also um, mention and even inserted sections of publications from people outside of the people of God as needed to um, confirm the presentation. And it's very interesting, especially when you study the synoptical gospels. And I um, repeat it again, this principle that is very important when we consider also the books of Sister White, that between the gospels you find not um, reproduction of the biography of Christ in the same aspect. And therefore, you cannot say this is not true. Because Matthew presented Jesus to whom? Do you remember? If you copy this and you don't hear the explanation, this will not have use for you because you will not understand why is there this. So Matthew write to whom? Wrote to whom? Yes. And how we know this? There can be many prophecies from the Old Testament which are fulfilled in the New, and the prophecies in the Old Testament would only appeal to the Jews. The genealogy. The genealogy and the prophecies, the combination of both. Because how he began his book, which is the first chapter of Matthew, genealogy. is the genealogy. Is the genealogy. He began this way. Because for a Jew, in order that they recognize you, you need to prove that you are a Jew. Otherwise, don't lose your time with any other explanation because this will have no use at all. They will not accept you as authority if you are not a Jew. And they needed to prove that he was a Jew from father and from mother. Okay? Therefore, you have the chronology of which other gospel that confirm both genealogies. Which is the other one? Luke. Luke. Okay. Therefore, many people say, yeah, but these don't combine the chronology of Matthew and the chronology of Luke. How this happened? So it's a contradiction in the same genealogy. How do you answer this? Correct. One is the genealogy from the father. The other one is from the mother. That is the difference. But in order to become a Jew, with genealogy gives you the identity of a Hebrew man. Mother. Okay? What was the case of Timothy? His mother was a Jew. Yes, but not his father. His father was a Greek. But he was recognized as a Jew person. Okay? Because he was able to present her origin, mother line, as a Hebrew. And he was circumcised afterwards, okay, because of the reputation and the situation of the time, because he was not before he began his ministry. So this is, for example, one um, illustration that allow us to understand that the lack of information in one gospel or the amplification and expansion of this information in another gospel don't contradict themselves, only confirm the synoptical um, aspect of them. And in the same situation is also these books. And that was one of the arguments used that uh, give a lot of uh, importance to it. We find 
that in the Bible we have a lot of books also compiled in the Bible himself. Um, give me, for example, give me one example from at least one book that was put together after all the visions were given. And all the vision is chronological. The date, so and so. During the king, so and so, I received this vision from the Lord, for example. There are a lot of books, but at least mention to me one. Yeah, Hezekiel is one. Hezekiel is one. He Hezekiel say in the first chapter, I was in the river of Ulai, and then I received this vision, and that was so and so in this place and so. When you go from chapter 40 of Hezekiel until the end of the chapter is another year during all the other chapters until the 40 also were different years. But then he say, now began the visions of the temple. So not only the subject, but also the dates were different. But one that is extremely evident is the book of Agai. Because the book of Agai have how many chapters? Open your Bible and look. How many chapters have a guy? How are they divided? are divided according to visions. They are divided according to visions. How many visions do you have in the book? Four. Maybe I am wrong, I thought we are five. I don't know, it says it had because I have the study Bible, so the okay. final one here is the fourth message of heaven. Okay, it's possible. Okay, four. And all of them is according to the date. So you see how this book came to existence, how they came. They were like four articles. And when the, all of them was finished, then become a book. So the process of compilation that we find in the testimonies is not something new. We find this over and over through the books of the Bible. For example, Jeremiah. Jeremiah wrote different letters to the captives in Babylon. Those deported by the first, by the second, and by the third deportation. And these letters were included in the book of Jeremiah. Okay? The letter was inspired, was given from the Lord to him to send to the captives in Babylon with the confirmation of the 70 years of a captivity and the promise of the restoration and coming back again. And that was inserted. So that was not a series of visions, but we find that approximately in the middle of the book, we have letters that were added to the completely book as we have now. So that a book is co composed by articles, letters, visions, is not something new. Habakkuk, for example, what can you, can you tell me about Habakkuk? How is the composition of this book? This is a very interesting one because have visions and have a prayer that occupy one complete, almost one completely chapter that the prophet um, received by inspiration. So in the middle of the book of Habakkuk, we have a poem. 
when you see it in the original writing. So everything is in prosa. And finish with prosa. One section at the end is also in poetry. But in the middle of the book is a poem that was the prayer of Habakkuk to God. So the combination of different kinds of writings and different kinds of original publications that become the final book as we have it now went through a similar process as we have now the spirit of prophecy. Now we are going to introduce a break to continue after five minutes because of the time. Okay? So thank you so much. <laughs>